Sage Wanderer here and welcome to my cabin down by the creek. So today I thought I would uh, revisit one of my earliest videos. I did a video called um, Antifa Hit List and the Purge. I think that was back in 2017. If you'll recall, I fell prey to a hoax at that time because every Antifa member that I was running into, and in Portland, Oregon, trust me, you run into lots of them, uh, I had a friend who was an Antifa member that uh, had joined, and we had a huge argument over it. But I was hearing from them about The Purge. Now, there's a movie, a series of movies called The Purge, and my, uh, you know, the person that I knew, and as well as other Antifa members I encountered, they kind of glommed on to that movie. But really the idea of a purge is something that comes from communism. When communists take over, they purge everyone that might be a threat to their government as soon as their totalitarian control kicks in. And they have the ability to do that legally. They make it legal to murder people. And, um, but the movie The Purge is about a social experiment and that becomes a, uh, like a, a holiday where all crime is legal, including murder, and up to class four weapons. In the prequel to that, which I saw recently, they say the quiet part out loud. They, they tell you that the reason that the purge was put together to begin with was because uh, they needed to thin the population, particularly the low-income people. In the first prequel movie, the origin movie, they actually paid participants. Uh, they wore contact lenses with, um, with video cameras built in so they can witness and broadcast the mayhem. The more you participated or the bloodier you were, the more evil you were, the more money you received. And later on as the storyline in this series of movies continues, it becomes like a national holiday of crime. And in the most, I think the most recent movie was what it was about the election. It was about, I think it was called Election Day. Um, in that movie, they have a black mass where the elites get together and they sacrifice people. And I found that in particular, the, the movies in, in general are very disturbing. But that scene in particular I found very blasphemous. It was... Um, done in the Christian format. The person doing the murdering was a priest uh, or wore priest clothing. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was extremely disturbing. And the very fact that this kind of movie is popular uh, tells me that there's a sickness in our world where people uh, get joy out of the idea of hurting other people or, or getting revenge or going on some kind of crime spree. And it's, I think, a fantasy for some people. And I know from my experience with Antifa, it's a fantasy for them. They told me that they were going to break into people's houses. They were going to uh, cut their throats while they slept after sneaking into their house, take what they wanted from the houses, and then burn them down. And this was something that excited them. There was a bloodthirsty rage associated with them when they talked about this. And this was in the protests in Portland back in the day. Now, even though they said they were going to do this on November 4th, 2017, and I got super prepped for it. I was wearing body armor. I had my AK, I had my Glock on my hip, and I was like, bring it on, Antifa. That turned out to be a test or test of whether we would respond. I found it interesting on that day. Pickup trucks from eastern Oregon loaded down with cowboys and all their weapons came in to protect the Capitol because there was a rumor uh, circulating that they were going to take down the Capitol and occupy the Capitol building there in uh, Salem, Oregon. And I witnessed rows and rows and rows of uh, ready, to bat ready to go to war cowboys from the eastern side of the mountains that weren't going to let them take their Capitol building. Now, luck luckily and, uh, you know, to the grace of God, it didn't happen on that November 4. But later on in the summer of love, the summer of love in 2020, Antifa and BLM committed many of those kinds of crimes. I believe that was their purge. I believe that was their intention, but I believe a lot of them just 
lost the nerve to go all the way. And so they burned some buildings. Some people got killed. We know what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And something I was telling them back in 2017 when they would talk big is I would say, look, you don't understand. There are people out there on the other side of the political spectrum that have been preparing for this kind of thing uh, since the 80s and 90s. That there are people out there that train every day. You guys aren't going to overthrow our government and come in our house and cut our throats armed with a pocket knife, with a switchblade. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> you guys are going to get yourself killed. And it was probably what I said along with what a lot of other people were telling them that caused them to start arming. And so Antifa started getting training and, uh, and, and banding together into small groups, into combat groups and um, into squads, as it were, and started practicing team tactics and weaponry, there was a training center in Salem that was training these people, and it was getting under the skin of a lot of the uh, conservatives that, are, that live around the capital there, that these people that were supposed to be on our side were basically arming the enemy. And since 2017, now into all these years later, what we're looking at six years later, seven years later, um, they... They clearly are more well-trained and organized. When you go out to these uh, pride parades and other things that might be, uh, uh, you know, any kind of uh, protest march or anything, there's a contingency of well-armed, apparently pretty well-trained, at least they're working at it, Antifa groups that really are a bigger threat now than they were six or seven years ago. They have this fantasy of purging us, of getting rid of society, everyone they see is politically incorrect, everyone they classify as a racist or a Nazi. And it is possible that they could rise up and try to commit these atrocities. Of course, unlike the Purge movies, it won't be legal. But legal is as, as legal does, right? I mean, if, if you're in control of the government, if you have a dictatorship, if you can topple a government and get in control of it, then anything is legal. Whatever is legal is whatever you say is legal. You can make it legal for some people to do it and other people not to do it, right? <laughs> and uh, if you're looking for a little comedy relief in these horror movies, there is a comedy version of The Purge that I've found kind of silly and entertaining. It's still quite disturbing. I mean, it's a nightmare. There's nightmare scenes. Really, The Purge series is a nightmare walking, right? Uh, but in the comedy version with Mike Epps, I think he's one of the greatest, uh, uh, most hilarious African-American um, deadpan kind of uh, comedians. And he hangs with uh, Martin Lawrence and people like that and uh, the higher end of black comedians. Um, I believe he was, uh, he actually had a cameo in Death at a Funeral. He's been in a couple other bigger movies, but I forget the name of this Purge movie. But uh, it's just about a black con man who uh, rips off a drug dealer, finds himself in a really rich neighborhood, and has to defend himself against all of the <laughs> all of the rich white folks that want to purge him. And it's just filled with ridiculous comedy. Um, I don't really recommend watching any of these movies because they're so horrific. But what interests me is that they tell the quiet part out loud in these movies. They tell you that the reason, the real reason behind The Purge was not a social experiment. It wasn't designed to get you to uh, vent all of your anger so you can live crime-free the rest of the year. That that was the premise that this purging or venting of aggression would cause the rest of the year to go by smoothly. But they say the quiet part out loud. They tell you in the, in the prequel movie that it's for depopulation. They want us to kill each other. They want us to do their dirty work. They being the elites. And so I think that the, there's a, a school of thought. Well, I mean, it's kind of Sun Tzu's art of war. That it's, uh, if you can get your enemies to destroy each other, <laughs> then you don't have to do anything but sit home and watch it and eat popcorn. So they really do want to divide this nation <clears throat> they want to divide us along the lines of race, economic status, politics, religion, divide and conquer. They want us to do the dirty work. They, they, I, they being the elites, I believe are behind the spread of street drugs, street gangs, MS-13, 
they're breaking down the borders to bring in more conflict, more disparity amongst the haves and the have-nots because they want to sit in their ivory tower and watch us all devour each other. They make these movies encouraging that. You know, one thing about the purge is that you can't help but let your mind go and think, what would I do? And of course, I think the only way to survive that kind of 24 hours, or I guess in the movies there's 12 hours of mayhem, is to dig a hole that nobody knows about, crawl inside it, pull the dirt over you, and don't come out for 12 hours. That's, <laughs> that's the only way you can guarantee your survival, which in this tumultuous world is kind of what I've done. I, I, I dug a hole in the side of uh, Oklahoma Hill, and uh, they can't dig me out with a backhoe, right? I, I'm living my life as though the purge were imminent now. But also, I enjoy country living. I enjoy the dirt road. Yeah, hey, my car is covered in mud or dust or some combination of both. And I've become an expert at zipping up and down these dirt roads. Let me tell you. <laughs> Try and catch me on these dirt roads. I know every exposed boulder, every washout, every rut. And I know how to drive on them. I was just uh, bragging about that the other day to a friend. But... Yeah, the only way to survive that kind of thing is to just pull away from society. And I suppose there will be at some point some campaign to get us to move into the cities. All of us that live down four to ten miles of dirt road. All of us who pulled out of society, they worry about us. They can control the people in the city. They can control their environment, their safety, their thinking, their economics. But people like me are harder to control. And what would they do to us but have to come out and confront us all individually? And we might band together. In a recent movie I saw, uh, somebody asked why they didn't come after this particular outlaw. And the person said, well, it's because he's got friends around here and they make the price too high. So they leave him alone. <laughs> Right now, that's, I think, why they leave Oklahoma alone. It's one of the freest states in the nation and probably one of the most well-armed in the nation as well, that and Texas. And, uh, Texas and Oklahoma are kind of on the same page for the most part. But the, that brings me to the, to the uh, conversation about EMP. I talk about EMP a lot, and some would say, Sage is obsessed with the EMP. What's with the, up with the EMP? It's because I believe it's the biggest threat we face as a nation. It fits into their concept of how to trigger a purge. Take away all the food, take away all the toys, all the electricity, all the games, all the distractions, uh, take away their electronic money, make people have to scrap and figure out where they're going to get their food, water, and shelter from, and they'll turn on each other. You know, in one of the, uh, one, in a very famous study, came out and said that if there was a loss of the power grid, that's not even an EMP which destroys all your electronics and even your ability to make solar power and things like that. Anything that's not in a Faraday cage gets destroyed. And so in that white paper though, they stated that 90% of the U.S. population would perish if we lost the power grid alone. In a recent movie that Obama had something to do with, I forget the name of it, starred uh, Pretty Woman, also forget her name. <laughs> but um, in this movie, which Obama had something to do with, it's got a lot of press because there's a, um, you know, two black people talking to each other and they said, you know not to trust white people, especially in an emergency. And that was uh, purportedly something came straight from Barack Obama. But this movie wasn't about an EMP. It was about an overall attack on the United States starting with a hack of the power grid. So whether you're talking about the hack of the power grid or you're talking about an EMP weapon, let's not forget these uh, spy balloons. Um, recently, I believe it was North Korea launched their first satellite. When they launched it, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, came out and said, we want everyone involved to respond with restraint. Now, was he telling the North Koreans, Koreans to, be, to act with restraint because now they have the ability to EMP us from a satellite? Or was he talking to the United States saying, hey, look, don't get, don't get into space wars here and shoot this out of the sky? I, I can't tell you what was on his mind when he made that mysterious statement. But whether it's from a balloon in the atmosphere, from a 
some kind of nuclear weapon that's exploded in high up in the atmosphere or something that is done from a satellite, the loss of the power grid in the United States would be catastrophic. People get their water from uh, power plants, I mean, excuse me, water treatment plants that use computer technology to treat the water, pumping stations that rely on circuitry. So an EMP or even just a hacking of the power grid would make it so the water doesn't turn on. If it's an EMP, the trucks don't run. If it's just a, a failure in the power grid, there's no refrigeration. If you don't know how to hunt, how to fish, how to gather, how to preserve food without refrigeration, if you don't know how to smoke and salt meat, if you don't know how to tell a poisonous plant from a beneficial plant, if you don't have some basic tools, some understanding of how the world works, and some basic physical abilities, then you will more than likely fall amongst the casualties if an EMP or the power grid were to fail. You know, our power grid is exposed. All of our cabling is above ground. There's also the possibility that the purge the breakdown of society, this time of chaos could be caused from a solar flare, something no one could really predict, something random. A solar flare can be very destructive. The last time we had a mass coronal ejection, uh, the telegraph system was brand new. And the electromagnetic uh, energy got into the power lines and it set all, not the power lines, but the telegraph lines, and it set all of the telegraph uh, started calling them phone poles, but all of the telegraph poles and cabling was all caught on fire. And predictions of a mass coronal ejection for us nowadays uh, would be, first of all, everything would catch fire. We have high voltage now running through these exposed cables. The, um, uh, the transformers that sit out in front of everybody's houses and the big transformers that would barely fit inside a shipping container that they use at transformer stations um, are made in other countries now, many of them in China. And we don't make our own uh, transformers any longer. So whether it would be an EMP, some kind of power surge, a uh, mass coronal ejection, any of that, you know, solar flare, could cause these uh, transformers to start exploding and overheating and melting down, causing fires. and. It takes years to replace them. We don't make them anymore, so we would, we'd be relying on foreigners who maybe were the person or people who were responsible for the attack to begin with. It would be up to them to replace our transformers for us. And then there's the dreams I've been having lately. If you missed my recent coffee talk, I talked about some post-apocalyptic dreams I have been having lately, and they're all post-EMP. They're always with very limited transportation, no electronics, a return to the old ways, which goes back to one of my favorite Coffee Talk subjects, uh, John Titor, who claimed that uh, because of a war, I don't think he named EMP, but he basically described a world with limited or no technology, a world, uh, a future world without entertainment, where many, many people had perished over the uh, tragic events because of a lack of ability to handle basic things like backwoods sanitation. They didn't own guns or know how to keep and clean and, and, uh, and maintain them or use them. So there's, we're so susceptible to that kind of attack. It's, you know, it starts to look like for various reasons, from our politics to our culture, to the breakdown of the family, to the corruption we see in our governments, and, and the, the evilness we see in major corporations. Um, you know, I could go on and on about what's in the food, about our medicine's really safe, and all those sorts of things. But it starts to appear like uh, that the elites, the people that are in power, really want to destabilize and destroy this country. They want to drive us down to the basics. And one of the most interesting things about the Purge prequel movie is that when they made it legal for all this murdering to happen, and even paid people to participate, there was almost no uh, participation. There was almost no participation 
at the beginning of the purge. Yeah, a few crazies who were psycho in the head came out and did some meanness. A couple of gangs decided to settle their score with each other. But in the prequel movie for The Purge, in the very first Purge, it was set on, uh, oh, uh, not Coney Island, or one of the New York boroughs, Staten Island, um, that the government had to send in mercenaries to do a bunch of killing, to make it look like people were participating. My hope, my dear hope, my, my hope based on faith in God and love, is that if the society were to break down, it would be more like my dreams, everyone pitching in together to help one another, that we wouldn't turn on each other, that we wouldn't become animalistic, that there wouldn't be a purge. There would just be a lot of scared people loving each other, pitching in with each other, trying to help each other, trying to get through, and that they're betting on an animalistic evil nature of humans that wouldn't prevail. I think love might prevail. I think it might become a happier, better place, honestly, if we had to lean on each other, if we had to love each other for our own survival. I, I hope that human nature is better than that. And that the evil ones who are planning, hoping, and rooting for such a disaster will be sadly disappointed. You know, I remember on the days after September 11, 2001, everybody was there for each other. Everybody was talking about it. Strangers became friends in front of public television monitors, in grocery store lines. American flags were seen everywhere for months or even years afterwards. I hope that if anything really bad happens, that the better angels that, that inhabit us, that the Holy Spirit would be at work in this world and we would destroy their plans with a simple thing called love. Thank you for watching this channel this and watching these videos. I want you to know I don't get any money from YouTube. I don't have any sponsors. I'm viewer funded and I don't require much. I live in a cabin in the woods. I just need enough to keep the lights on and the food in the cabinets and a little gas in my puddle jumper car and uh, to get up and down the dirt roads to the store. And so uh, your donations keep me alive and I very much appreciate you and I love all of you that take care of me. Once again, as a reminder, there's a link in my description of this video to PayPal and to Cash App, and you can send things to my P.O. Box. And uh, I hope that you get in touch with your better angel this week and give some thought. I, I believe that if everything were made legal overnight and murder was legal, that we would choose to continue to love and not to become monsters. Tell me what you think in the comments section, and we'll see you next time from my cabin down by the creek.